Sometimes we need to slow down and remember the simple pleasures in life. Good coffee, good books, and good company. Come on in. Take a seat. The coffee's just been brewed. Let's see who we have in the coffee shop today. What a beautiful day in the coffee shop. I'm looking for the book. The book on the table. Let's see. There is a book on a table. And the title of the book is Field of Valor. And the author's name is Matthew Betley. How you doing today, Matt? Oh, I'm doing great, Jess. How are you? Other than Mr. Frog trying to take over the show, doing absolutely fantastic. <laughs> All right, excellent. Ho- hopefully he doesn't win. I don't let him win. So you've got to tell me about Field of Valor. Oh, I, I, I'm happy to. In fact, uh, Field of Valor is, is the third book in the Logan West series. It comes out on 22 May, just in time for Memorial Day. And the story actually follows Logan West and his band of, of brothers and sisters, uh, part of a task force. And this, this uh, installment of the series picks up approximately six months after Oath of Honor, the second book in the series, ended. So what kind of challenges is Logan going to be tackling? Can you give me a few hints? Oh, absolutely. So for readers who who are familiar, first off, with the books overall, I write very intense, violent, action-packed, emotional roller coasters from the first page until the end. And, uh, you know, without giving away too much of the events of the first two books, in case people want to go back and pick up the series, um, Logan and the task force that he's now a part of at the behest of the president of the United States, they are about to uncover the organization that's been manipulating global events to create instability over the past two books. And they're going to be faced with a very short timeline and kind of a condensed uh, um, series of violent confrontations that I, that they have to get through to help prevent uh, further calamity to both the United States and and some of our other global partners. Wow, that sounds really intense. So, is this isn't going to be the last adventure we go on with Logan, is it? No, not at all. In fact, I'm currently working on the fourth book as we speak for 2019. I've already got additional stories planned out in my head for books five and six. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, we're de- I'm definitely going to keep going with these characters. Cool, cool, because once you get hooked on a great cast of characters, no need to cha- change too many of them, is there? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, one of the biggest things I did was I introduced two new characters in book two, uh, Cole Matthews and Amira Cerrone, that readers absolutely love and respond to. In fact, I get more reader feedback on Amira than I do on almost anyone. Um, so I, I so I have some things planned for them as well. What makes Amira so special? Uh, so... So she's uh, she's the daughter of an Ethiopian immigrant and an Italian D.C. homicide detective. And she's beautiful, deadly, lethal, somewhat semi-serious. And uh, she's also now involved in a, in a, a semi-relationship with one of the uh, main characters in the series. Not Logan, is it? No, no. Logan's still with his wife, Sarah. As 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 of book three. Cool, cool. So you've got a few more adventures to come. That's that's great because I know when I get started on a, ser- a thriller series, I'm always looking for when's the next one. And hint, Matt, I love repeat guests in the coffee shop too. Excellent. Now. Field of Valor, you timed it to come out with Memorial Day. And can you, was there anything special behind that? 
Uh, well, uh, you know, the, the way these books are structured, initially we were a March publication for the first two books, but these really are big, action-packed, blockbuster beach reads. And, you know, being a former Marine officer, I also really appreciate the, the seriousness of Memorial Day. And it just worked out that, th that we decided to go with this time frame to try and bring this series to as many readers as possible. Well, from one military army spouse, I've got to thank you for your service. So how long were you in the Marines? Uh, I spent 10 years in the Marine Corps. Now, how did being in the Marines impact your writing? Well, I, you know, the, the reality is, it, it, I mean, it had everything to do with my writing, especially with Overwatch, because I basically wrote what I know as a former Marine officer, someone who was very privileged uh, and fortunate enough to once command a scout sniper platoon, and as somebody who did a couple of deployments, I decided to write what I had learned and create this entertaining action series about a former Force Recon platoon commander whom, when we meet him, is a actually a relapsing alcoholic at the very beginning of Overwatch. And as all my readers and fans know, I'm a recovering alcoholic sober more than nine years now, so that was just an aspect of my personality that I infused in Logan West. I think that is fantastic. In fact, congratulations. On nine years sober. Thank you. It's actually what I believe it's the most important thing I can ever talk about uh, when I'm doing all of these events. Uh, you know, because if if my story resonates with one person, you know, even just one person who's struggling with the same issue, you know, of being addicted to alcohol that I was, then it's it's all well worth it. No, that is a fantastic thing to also be able to promote while you're promoting your books. So was is there a special reason you picked Field of Valor? Uh, and, and no, it's just, you know, so here, here's a, a little bit of inside baseball in the publishing world. Most titles that authors come up with do not survive first contact. Uh, usually, even if the editor likes the title, what happens is either the salespeople or somebody else... Um, want to change it for a variety of reasons. And this was not the initial title. The initial title that I had was Rogue Republic. Um, but for a variety of reasons, uh, we all uh, decided to go with Field of Valor, and, and, which I think is a fantastic title. Just like pl battle plans, they rarely survive first contact with the enemy. Uh, I think I've even said that in one of my books before. Yeah, it's always fun when you can bring those real-world analogies out in the publishing world. So, was it hard to fictionalize the things you'd been through? And uh, no. bring I'm them, sorry, go ahead. And bring them to life through the eyes of Logan West? Uh, for me, no. I, I always, before I started writing, well, how I actually even decided to write is, is an interesting story. I was sober for nine months, or I'd been sober for six months. I was on vacation with my wife, and I was still in the Marine Corps, and I was reading this boring book that had been recommended by Stephen King in a magazine, and I literally turned to my wife because I was so angry because of my level of boredom, and I said, I can do a better job than this. And I obsessed about it for over a year. And then finally, after enough obsessing, I, I wrote a five-year plan on a whiteboard. And I sat down and I, 18 months, eight days later, I had the first draft of Overwatch. But before I started writing, I knew exactly what I wanted to write, how I wanted to write it. And, and I just did that. I, you know, I, I just did what I wanted to do. And I, and I didn't have a master's of fine arts and creative writing and, and, and bachelor's in English or anything like that. I've always been a, a, a grammar guru and a very sarcastic, uh, so I basically wrote what I would want to read, and, and I just kept it that simple. Well, one of the sayings you always hear in writing is, write what you know. Exactly, and, and I remember seeing that somewhere, and, and I took that to heart. Now, what advice would you give to someone who's sitting there going, 
Yeah, I want to write a book someday. Uh, first off, I, I would say have a plan B, C, D, and E. Have, then I would say you better have thick skin. You better ha- be able to deal with more rejection than you've probably ever had in your life. And you better have a, an abundance and, and then a reserve uh, of uh, determination because this is an absolutely brutal business. Uh, and, and my eyes are now wide open after being in it for two years. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, the odds are heavily stacked against people breaking into publishing, especially because the market, depending on your genre, is so saturated. And, and with the increase in digital publishing and self-publishing, it just makes it even that much harder. Um, but then, you know, having said all of that, If you make it through all of the various gates, I would also add one thing because, you know, I just touched on it, and that is always be true to who you are. I have yet to change my writing style for anyone, and I I will not do it no matter who gives me guidance or advice. Um, You know, I like a good officer, I'll listen to my NCOs and my staff NCOs about big, broad decisions, but at the end of the day, the, the decision is still mine. That is outstanding advice, and I think it's great that you mentioned be true to who you are, because sometimes someone will come across, and you can tell when it's fake. Oh, absolutely. Readers see through that. If if I were to, tra- it'd be like asking me to write a Nicholas Sparks novel. That's never going to happen in in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, although it'd probably be one wildly entertaining romance novel, but, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is is readers will see through that. If you try and pretend to be something you're not in real life, I am an incredibly fast talking, sarcastic person who does not take himself seriously, even though I've had such a serious life. And that's how I write my characters. Now, gotta ask, how does Logan take his coffee? Uh, Logan would probably be a, 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 a black coffee drinker, although he might take it with a little cream and sugar. I can tell you John Quick is definitely a black coffee drinker. Okay. Okay. Is, <coughs> is black coffee something Logan picked up from his creator? Actually, well, uh, n- no, I, I actually drink my, uh, my, and I was just telling this story on Twitter to Jack Carr and uh, a couple followers the other day. I, I actually like drinking the frou-frou stuff. I drink, you know, with French vanilla creamer and, and, and things like that. I used to drink Splenda, but I realized it was not good for my health, and I gave that up uh, uh, several years ago. But So I, I, I drink my coffee with flavored creamer. Usually na- all natural flavored creamer. But what the, the story that I was telling uh, Jack Carr and a couple others on Twitter the other day was that I used to get this. I used to have this gunny, and, and he used to tell me. By the way, is it uh, is swearing prohibited in this program? Before I tell this story, so I tell a clean version of it. We are not FCC regulated. Excellent. So in that case, I will be honest. So I, I used to have this gunny when I was a, a new second lieutenant, and he used to see me drink uh, coffee with cream, flavored creamer, and then back then I'd put in sweetener, and he'd always turn to me and go, Sir, why, why are you drinking that frou-frou shit? And he used to give me grief about it all the time until finally I turned to a gunny and said, Gunny, I, I'm secure enough in my manhood that I can drink whatever the fuck I want. And after that, that was the end of the conversation. He just said, Roger, sir, good to go. Uh, but it, but it, and I actually, I think I even used that line in Overwatch in one part. And I think I recall seeing that conversation on Twitter the yep. other day myself. Yep, true story. So you do, do a lot of your fans interact with you on social media? Uh, on Twitter, absolutely. I'm always happy to respond to. Uh, various tweets, you know, when I have the time, uh, I, I do have people who have submitted comments to my website, which is just matthewbetley.com. 
but I am most active and interactive on Twitter, and I would urge everyone to follow me at Matthew Betley. Cool, cool. That's always, it's always fun to be able to actually fo- follow the author of the, of the book you're reading and know it's actually them responding. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I don't have a, a, like 100,000 followers yet or anything that would overwhelm me. I'm happy to get there, though. Well, it's all part of dreams and wishes. So, if Logan West had one favorite vacation spot, where would he go? Uh, Right now, I think Logan West would maybe want to go to the Bahamas. And I say that for a variety of reasons, and I'll leave it at that. That's cool. So, he he's a fun in the sun kind of guy. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure right now how much of a fun in the sun kind of guy Logan is after, uh, the events of book two, Oath of Honor, but I, I definitely know that he appreciates, uh, uh, trying to find a nice location where he could spend some quality time with his wife. So does Logan's wife, Sarah, get stressed out by his day job? Uh, she does not. Uh, you know, like many uh, Marine wives that I knew in my time and, and spouses of military people that I know now, uh, she understands what comes with, uh, with being his wife. But she's also a fighter, too, if you remember the opening of Overwatch. You know, she's been with Logan from his days in the Marine Corps. She knows that there, there, there's nobody better in my fictional world to defend our national security. And, and she knows, though, also at the end of the day, he'll, he'll fight his damnedest to come home every night. Uh, you know, but she also knows the risks. So is Logan also a Marine officer? Uh, yes, Lo- Logan is a former Marine Force Reconnaissance Company platoon commander. So what rank would that make him? Uh, he, he, he got out of the Marine Corps uh, as a captain, which I coincidentally did as well. Hmm, I'm seeing a few parallels here. So is Logan part of the CIA or one of the other alphabet soup agencies, or is this a private off-the-books program? Uh, it, it's Well, so in Overwatch, if you recall... Uh, he is brought in by one of his close friends, Mike Benson, who is, is an FBI special agent uh, to be part of this joint task force uh, dealing with the events in Overwatch. And from there, that's when, after the events of Oath of Honor, that they then form a task force to address the, the global threat head on. That's outstanding. Now, I do have to ask you, with Things like peace on the Korean Peninsula starting to break out. Did that impact your writing at all? Uh, actually, no. It's funny because I, I talk about uh, the, the leader of North Korea at the beginning of book three uh, because I, I do have some knowledge on, on that situation in the peninsula itself. I've even been to the DMZ uh, in, in a former life for a different reason. And the North Koreans came out and took pictures of us. Uh, we, we, we waved at them. It was, I've been in the, the piece. It's just, it's actually one of the spookiest places I've ever been in my life. Uh, but no, I, it did not impact my writing. Uh, and, and in fact, it might still be the location of something I have in mind for a future book. And I know what you mean by the DMZ being one of the spookiest places. Been there myself. Yep, yep. So I, I actually sat in the building, stepped into North Korea. Uh, you know, they, they looked in the windows at us. It was, it, was, it's a, it was very wild. I was just there on the USO tour, but it was oh, okay. still a fascinating experience. I have a feeling you weren't on the tour. No, I was not on the tour. That, that, uh, I was absolutely not on any tour that they would offer to people. <laughs> Sounds like you had the more interesting experience. 
Uh, yeah, it was four of us and four armed guards from South Korea. Yeah, that could be a hair-raising experience. Uh, I wouldn't say it was hair-raising. We weren't overly concerned. It was just, it was, it was fascinating. So, what is your worst experience with food, and does any of that translate into Logan's experiences with food in the book? Uh, I would have to say that uh, my worst experience with food, uh, I'm sure, I don't know. I can't, I actually can't think of any horrible experiences I've had with food. Although I will say, uh, I did get to go as a as a Marine officer when we deployed to Africa after 9-11. I was on ship for six months, and uh, we went below the equator, and I, again, I was able to participate in the shellback ceremony, which is a Navy tradition. There's even a Navy order. Otherwise, it would be considered hazing. And one of the worst experiences I had was having to bob for apples in – a in buckets filled with food and vomit that had been sitting out in the sun for I think three days. That was not so much fun. <laughs> a shellback. Now that is a special Navy tradition. It is. I may be an Army spouse, but I know a little bit about all four branches. Yeah. So does but but Logan doesn't have any issues with any food. I I don't really. Um, I don't really include like time for them to eat meals or anything like that in my books. The pace is pretty nonstop. So no catching your breath while reading. No, not at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I had somebody uh, uh, read a, a, an advanced copy of the fourth book, I think for like nine hours straight once. Or the third book, I should say. Sorry. I was going to say fourth. You've already got the yeah. fourth in beta reading stage? No, not yet. So who are your first readers? Do you have former battle buddies read it first? Do you have – what audience do you turn to as your first line test audience? Uh, my agent and just a couple select friends that uh, that are now huge fans of the books. Uh, in fact, those are those are my like when I first submitted the first draft. Well, when I finished the first draft of Overwatch, the best people I sent it to were my friends who knew me and just were like, "Yeah, whatever, dude. You wrote a book." And then when they finished the book, they looked at me and were like, "Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> like this is that good? And we know you, and you're just like you." <laughs> and and now they're very big fans of the series, so I always give it to them first because I know they'll be critical. And give me direct, honest, and harsh, if needed, feedback. Now, having been a Marine officer, you have to submit your work for review to the DOD. Uh, I, I do. I, I, I do. It goes, it goes through you know, the agency I work for. Have they ever redacted anything that's caused you problems? Nope, not at all, because I, I know exactly what to stay away from. I intentionally, everything that I use is stuff that I have been able to research on the internet. I make sure that everything that, uh, or, or things that I, were provided to me in an intentionally unclassified way, so that there's never been a single issue. Uh, in fact, my second book, uh, my pre-publication review office, had it back to me within 48 hours. Wow, that's fantastic. That's fast for a government agency. It is. Well, again, I know what to stay away from. I'm not trying to tell, I'm not telling nonfiction accounts of things that I did. I'm telling, I, I write regardless of how authentic it may feel to readers, I am telling fiction. I am trying to entertain the reader more than anything else. So what's the highest praise someone could give your books? Oh, the highest praise is that Hey, Matt, I am exhausted at work today because I've been all up all night and I couldn't put this book down. I hate you. I, I, that, that, those are the best emails I get. Or Matt, um, I, I skipped. I actually had somebody once say, I went into work late today to finish your book. 
And, uh, or, hey, how come I have to wait another year for your next book to come out? Well, you know, talk to the publisher. <laughs> That's my response. Or, or I'll tell some of these people, well, I'm sorry you didn't get so much sleep. That's a you problem. <laughs> and, but they know I'm being sarcastic. It, Sounds like a fun one. I've actually been known to take the day after a book comes out off work if I really want to read it. Well, excellent. Yeah, that and and those that would also be very high praise. Because you know, the most important thing to me as the author is the experience that my readers have with my stories. That's all that matters. So you want them to have that white knuckle thrill mm-hmm. ride, the Yep. The book in the hand, feet in the sand, sitting on the beach or at the pool, and just going along for the ride. Yep, that's it. It's it's really that simple. I've actually had a couple of people say, you know, I found my, I had to put the book down because I found my heart rate increasing. <laughs> I, I, like the, Again, those comments are fantastic. Now, when you're writing and you're in the zone with that, do your palms get sweaty and does your heart rate increase? No, no, I, I'm a, like when it comes to writing, I have a very deliberate process. I put on my headset, I listen to music scores from, you know, a variety of movie genres and, you know, some of the best composers out there. I, and I actually don't even feel like an author. I feel like more of a scribe. And I've said this since day one. Um, I actually see the action playing out in my head. I hear the dialogue. I feel the emotion and I'm just writing down what I'm experiencing. And it's, it's really that simple. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, I'm going to drop a little teaser here. Because it is about time to pay those radio station bills. But there's a movie deal in the works. That is absolutely correct. In fact, uh, we have we, we have reached an agreement with Thunder Road Pictures, uh, the same production company that produced excellent movies like John Wick, The Town. Uh, we're involved in Sicario and a number of others, and we've named Braden Aftergood to produce. Braden is an excellent movie maker and is responsible for. Recent films like Hell or High Water, Wind River, Lone Survivor, and even Battleship. Uh, And and the intent is to make a a worldwide franchise that's a combination of John Wick, Lone Survivor, and Sicario, which really kind of sums up the kinds of things that I write. Well, you can tell us more about that on the other side. And I am going to pour you a fresh cup of coffee. And the creamer's on the table, and we will see you on the other side. Thank you all for hanging in there with us while we paid those radio station bills. Now, Matt, I know we were mentioning Movie Deal, and you gave, talked a lot about it before we left, but what's the current situation on it? What's the update? Well, so where we are, and, and the way it works in Hollywood, is once you sign the option contract, that gives the production company 18 months to get the movie into production, basically to start filming. And where we currently are is we have a screenwriter on board already, J.P. Davis, and he is currently doing another treatment on the story, and once that gets approved, then they'll start adaptation of the screenplay. And, And I actually am still in contact with the producer, even though I'm technically not a consultant on the project. And, uh, you know, but they're they're bouncing story ideas off of me. I was just going to say, how involved are you in the screenplay? I mean, we're not going to see Logan West on screen wearing a tutu and doing ballet, are we? No, no, not at all. In fact, I've been assured that they want to stay as true to the story as possible, you know, focusing on Overwatch. That's great. So are you hoping that maybe... uh... Your second and even your third book get picked up for movies. Oh, that would be the, that would be the plan. I mean, the, the, those 
possibilities are written into the contract. But it just depends. It, obviously, the, the market and in this case, the audience will determine whether or not that happens. But I have faith that they will make a very high quality product based on the movies that they've made. You rattled off some pretty well-known titles there. I, I, exactly. I'm very, very fortunate to be with the people in Hollywood that I have who are making this work and making this movie. So, you wrote the book, your first one, Overwatch. What was your next step after you finished writing Overwatch? How did you catch the agent and get through all those locked doors? Well, this goes back to that, yeah, this goes back to that first question about, you know, how I got here and what advice I would give writers. Uh, so I finished the first draft in 18 months and eight days. I then spent six months editing the, the rough draft, and then I let some people read it. And then when they said, okay, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you in, in the next life uh, or, uh, when you're an author, then I started submitting it to literary agencies. Now, at the time, I used what's called Jeff Herman's Guide to Publishers, Editors, and Agents, I use the 2012 version, which lists all the reputable agencies. I know there are other places you can get those, those lists. And back then, there were only 92 that handled my kind of commercial fiction. I submitted 92 queries over, I think, six months. And then I, and, and each one wants, has different requirements. Some want the first five pages. Some want 10 pages. Some want 50 pages printed out. And, and, but each one has very specific requirements. And if you don't follow the instructions to AT, they will look to just reject you automatically because I've been told that these agencies get anywhere of up to 2000 submissions a month and they only handle a handful of clients. So I re then started receiving rejection after rejection after rejection. And then it was number 83 that said, we can't believe you haven't been picked up. We want this. And then even after that, it was another 15 months before we had our first multi-book deal with Simon & Schuster. I mean, you, that's why I tell people, buckle up and, and, and get ready for an emotional roller coaster because it is, it is not fun, it's not easy, but it's intended to weed people out. Well, you've earned the Eagle Globe and Anchor. I don't think failure is exactly in your vocabulary. That I, yeah. Plus, my personality is a bit on the extreme side, so I was going to keep going no matter what. <laughs> I mean, come on! You earned the Eagle Globe of an anchor. That says a lot about determination and perseverance, right there. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I would agree, and, and, and in addition, I would say it also instilled in me the discipline to be able to see this through and to do it methodically. Okay, so you, you definitely do have a plan. Oh, absolutely. Have a plan. I would also say have a business plan because I also established contacts in various media outlets so that in the event I did not have a publisher, I was prepared to self-publish because I knew the book was good enough. That's daring. That's and, very and daring. I, well, I also, put I also was willing to put $20,000 of my own money uh, where my mouth was. I mean, that's how con con confident I was at the time. That's awesome. So you, you kind of knew a good thing when you saw it. Well, I, I thought I had written something that was uh, worthwhile and wildly entertaining, but it wasn't until I started receiving the kind of feedback that I did from people who actually do read the genre. Well... I've been known to read anything, including the cereal box, if it hangs around long enough. But as I have said on air on multiple occasions, Thriller is my first love. So you may have picked up another really good fan, because I tend to be partial to my coffee shop guests, too. Well, good. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to have every reader I can get on board the Logan West train. So, what would Logan's, Logan's favorite treat be from a coffee shop? 
Ah, uh, well, in that case, it would probably be a, a pumpkin cream cheese muffin from Starbucks. <laughs> that is uh, hands down. <laughs> and what's your favorite oh. treat? Well, that would be the exact same one. <laughs> but, but then I think John Quick, if he were with Logan, would probably punch Logan in the throat for ordering it. <laughs> so would John Quick just be getting a cup of black coffee and complain about the fact that it's Starbucks and they're paying five bucks for it? Pro- very likely. <laughs> yes. And, and he probably harassed the baristas. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a fun kind of guy to have around on occasion, though. Oh, he is. He's wildly entertaining. Believe me. I have a feeling John Quick is the guy you won't watch in your six o'clock. Oh, well, both of them are. It's just that so, so you know, Logan's the very serious side of my personality, but John Quick is the side that uh, is the way that I interact with people on a daily basis. Cool. Cool. Now, when you were writing this book, was there anything that you really wanted to use, but then you decided, no, that's too graphic, or that's too much, or that would never, you know, something that came to mind that you said that would never really happen, that you just didn't put in the book? Uh, for the for Field of Valor? No, in fact, I, I knew exactly how I wanted to structure the book, and uh, I I did the research and just sat down and did it. Uh, no, I, it, in fact, it turned out exactly a, as I planned it. With your background, do you have to do a lot of research when you're working on these books, or does most of it come straight out of your head? Uh, it depends. Uh, yeah, there are always new weapons and technology and techniques that I have to research. I mean, I have been out of the Marine Corps for nine years, Um almost nine years. And, and, and the reality is, is that things are always evolving. Uh, you know, units are getting reorganized. It just depends. Um, but there's also a lot of things that I do know that, that I'm able to write about comfortably. Now, when it comes to settings, it also depends on where I'm, you know, writing a setting. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to travel to Iraq today to write a, a, a you know, research a location. But, you know, with the internet being what it is, uh, there are so many resources available to authors that an author should be able to capture the essence of a location um, enough to make the reader believe he or she has been there. You know, I, I kind of write, I, I, I describe that aspect of it as a little literary magic, you know, because it doesn't matter if I've been there or not. All that matters is that you think I have. That's a really cool way to put it. That really is. Yep. What was the hard, hardest thing to research for Field of Valor? That one thing that just drove you crazy. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. I'm trying to think about it. Hmm. There was nothing that was actually especially difficult. Oh, yes, there was. There is a yacht sequence. And I was not getting luck on uh, obtaining blueprints for this yacht that I use in this wild, wild sequence. And um, finally, I reached out to the yacht, like one of the East Coast dealers of that type of yacht. And then he sent me some links to some places, including videos that were walkthroughs of that yacht. So I was able to get, no kidding, like a walkthrough uh, via a video and, and it actually, it, it, it gave me everything that I needed for that scene. That's fantastic. Now they say editing is slaying your darlings and you may have had everything plotted out, but was there one thing you had to take out, rearrange or drastically change when it came to editing Field of Valor? No. In fact, I love editing. Editing for me is an opportunity to make it that much better, better every single time I edit something, even if it's just in an infinitesimal way. In fact, I can proudly state that I've never had anything really cut out of any of my three books so far. I think that is a first. Uh, it's, I, I, I've, had, I've had, like, there are line edits, 
and there are, you know, like cutting out maybe a, a sentence here or maybe a paragraph, but I have had no major reorganization. Uh, I, I've had a couple plot points that I had to address in Oath of Honor, but no, it's it, it, the editing has been uh, productive and, and, and I actually enjoy it. And Field of Valor was was uh, you know a breeze to edit. I was I was thrilled. I also try and pride myself on turning in the most polished product that I can, so that it's almost like a challenge to my editors to find things to to try and hit me on. But that's just a that's just me. <laughs> so I know you're working on book four. Is there a location or any little hint you could give us? Oh, I, I, yeah, absolutely. And, and I've said it, I, 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 and I kind of hinted at it with uh, Logan West and his intended vacation plans. But I will tell you, we're, we're heading south, uh, south of the border and, and south, of, south of the border for, for book four. So we are going south and sunny for book four. We are, uh, and, and you know, we, we're, we, we might might be uh, taking a little bit of a, a Caribbean vacation, and then then maybe a, an adventure in South America. Okay. What kind of firearm does Logan like, other than uh, well, Logan- anything? Yeah, so he, so Logan is particularly partial to a Kimber Tactical II 45 caliber pistol. Um, although he's obviously uh, competent with all firearms, uh, but that that's his, uh, his his pride and joy. And the reason, the actual reason that I picked that is that I fired that when I, I mean, gosh, probably 17 years ago. When I was a young young lieutenant in a range, and it was, and I used to be a weapons instructor, and it was like throwing darts. I mean, it was just so darn accurate; it felt so good, and that's why I picked uh, that as Logan's choice of sidearm. Now, does Logan carry? Well, I'm sure he does, but what is his plan B? Does he have a favorite knife or a favorite secondary go-to weapon? Uh, he he carries a Recon Mark II or I think Mark IV. I have to look it up again. Uh, that, that that's his personal knife that he carries. And, and you know, and John Quick because he's kind of a a bit of a throwback to the Marine Corps. He you know he carries a 1911 and a K bar if if they're going out and about. Ye old K bar and 1911. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, lo- I both of those are tried and tested, tried and true. Those are tried, true, tested. Yeah, and then some. <laughs> and the stuff of legends. Absolutely. Now, I know we've mentioned firearms, which is going to be one of those things that, in the thriller genre, come on, they come up. But are you personally a firearms a Second Amendment person, do you carry, or don't you want to discuss that? That is some. I do I actually. I, I, you know, I am a big proponent of the Second Amendment, but I, but, but I, without getting into the politics of it, I believe like people who are trained like I was or can clear background checks, you know, should be able to, should be uh, cleared to carry. I also believe that you know the system is set up in such a way that it, it seems like. You know, law enforcement agencies aren't talking to each other that, you know, to the national background check system. It just it seems like there's a lot of things broken. But no, I, I'm a big proponent of it. And I I definitely have uh, steps in place to uh, to protect myself when I'm out and about. Understood or ura. Yep. You know, you know what they say? It's better to have a gun and not need one than to need one and not have one. So what do you carry, if I might ask? Uh, that I'm not going to disclose, but I, I put it this way. I, I, have, I have more than enough on me to, to handle myself. Uh, but I will say, well, you know, I'm a very big proponent of Sig Sauer firearms. <laughs> I have a feeling that's a big clue. Yep. 
Although I do have different, uh, I also have different ones for different occasions, depending on what I'm doing. Of course. Yeah. Like shoes. If you're, I totally understand, Matt. I totally get it. Now, different, you know, there's, does, is Logan a sniper? No, no. Logan, Logan is a force reconnaissance platoon commander. So he, so he's a, you know, he's been to basic reconnaissance course, uh, you know, airborne school, you know, what they call jump school, uh, dive school, and, and he, you know, he, he's he's a bit of a tactical genius. Do they use sniper rifles in your books? Do they come into play? They do. And they they do. In fact, uh, you know, depending on the the sequence and that I, that I'm writing. Who tends to find themselves behind that scope? Uh, well, you know, actually, I, I will tell it depends because they're all, you know, when, when in real life, I mean, I, honestly, the easiest part about being a sniper is pulling the trigger. The harder job is the spotter who's giving you uh, wind and elevation adjustments and having you to make, make those adjustments on the scope. Uh, and he's using what's called a spotter scope. But you know, nowadays you actually have things that can automatically do that and feed that data directly into uh, into a sniper rifle. It's actually kind of crazy how far technology has come since I left the Marine Corps. But it just depends on the situation. You know, John Quick is very proficient with a sniper rifle, as there's one scene in Oath of Honor, um, you know, that that dictates that. But then I have Logan uh, behind one uh, in Field of Valor. Okay. And but, but go ahead, sorry. I was going to say are there ever any issues trying to sneak weapons where they need them or get them in or out of places or do they ever have I, to you know, it's, abandon uh, them? So that's that's actually a great question because if you think about it, um, it especially in reality, it's hard to bring weapons into certain locations. So I am always trying to come up with ways so that they would realistically be able to bring weapons into another country or bring weapons into, you know, a, a location in the U.S. It just depends. But I'm always thinking about that because you can't just all of a sudden have Logan West and friends in the middle of a firefight inside a federal building and no one knew they had guns on them. I mean, that's just not realistic. Um, you know, it just depends. It, it, but, but I guess... My job is to make it as believable as possible. That is outstanding. Now, is there anything you wanted me to bring up that I didn't mention? Or anything else you'd like to tell readers or listeners? Uh, No, other than the book tour for Field of Valor kicks off on 19 May, starting at the Gaithersburg Book Festival in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And then all of the events are listed on my website under the events section at MatthewBetley.com. And I would also urge uh, your listeners to follow me on Twitter, like I said, at Matthew Betley. And I do believe there is also a Facebook page, a, a Facebook fan page that I update occasionally. Uh, I am, Like I said, I am most interactive on, on Twitter, though. Well, that covers my last two questions. See, you know, like a Marine, I like to overachieve. Hey, you, and from the sounds of it, you definitely have. I mean, very few people get a movie deal on their first book. Uh, we we are definitely uh, uh, fortunate, and, and, and it's, it's somewhat humbling and rewarding to be in this position. Uh, I, I, I got to tell you that personally, I'll feel much better about it when I actually see the movie in the theater. <laughs> Or at least see the promos that it's coming to the theater? Exactly. You know, once I know it's actually made, uh, because like everything, uh, you know, until it's actually done, you just never know in this business. Well, I'd like to very much say thank you for your service, and thank you for an early copy of Field of Valor. I feel very lucky today. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Jess. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I love repeat guests. All well, right. I intend to be... Oh, sorry. No, continue, please. No, I say, I'm sure I'll be back.
Well, we have come to my favorite point in the show. I get to pour myself a fresh cup of coffee. And snatch this early release copy of Field of Valor off the table. And settle down for a great book. And the rest of you get it real soon, I promise. And I will see you folks next time in the coffee shop.